then I'd like to call this meeting of the select board to order. Um, the first item on the agenda I see is to review the meeting minutes. Uh, do I have any comments or? Uh, I have no comments. Okay, I would hear a motion then. I would move we approve the minutes. I'll second that. All in favor, Fred? Aye. Me? Aye. And uh, John will join us at some point. Okay, second item, vendor and payroll warrants. Um, I didn't have any comments to make on this. It's something that Jonathan signs. Do you have anything you wanted to say, Fred? I have no comments. Okay, all right, and we can go right by that. Um, now, this time for public comment, uh, time to listen to comments from the public related to items not listed on the agenda. So uh, I see Bill, I see Chris, Scott, and Emily. Do any of you have um, uh, any public comments on items not listed on the agenda? No? I imagine our, our this conservation restriction is on the agenda. It is on the agenda. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you're not going like, to tell us how fabulous we look tonight or anything like that. You look great. Oh, <laughs> Bill, you uh, awesome. You got. I love that fish in the background too on your uh, on your wall. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, let's get on to scheduled appointments then. The first one is um, Emily Boss with the Franklin Land Trust to discuss a proposed conservation restriction on. 41 acres of land at 134 Weber Road, owned by Bill and Jane O'Bear, and to request endorsement of the select board on the conservation restriction. Uh, and as, oh, no, Emily just moved. Um, so at this point, Brian, should I just let Emily describe? Yeah, Emily, why don't you describe what, uh, what's going on there? This is kind of the first we've heard about it. Very good. Um, thanks for seeing us. Um, we are working with with William with Bill and Jane O'Bear to conserve a portion of their property. Um, the conservation restriction uh, has been drafted with various uses of the land in mind. Things that would not be allowed in the future would be uh, development on the portions of the property that are uh, conserved, along with other activities that would degrade the natural resources there, like mining and um, for use and management of the land. Um, Conservation restriction, as you may be aware, or maybe you know, may not be as familiar with these. It's a it's a um, a legal document, which is drafted and recorded. Um, it is uh, something that is enforced by a third party. In this case, a land trust. Sometimes towns hold them. Sometimes the state holds them. And they, we just make a commitment to work with the current and future owners to um, continue to have the land managed as is indicated in the, in the restriction. Um, and some of the steps that are involved are to uh, draft it with attorneys. Uh, it's been reviewed by state attorneys. Um, we've received um, approval for local signatures, uh, which includes the select board of the town that the land is in, in Waitley, um, and then the landowner, uh, the land trust, and then we would send it to the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs for signature, and then it would be recorded. Um, the house on the property has been excluded. Um, there's a compost business, which is also ex excluded on the property. These have all been surveyed. Um, the boundaries of the land are going to be documented. There's a baseline document in, in um, the works, which has photos. Um, and reasons why, for conserving the land are there's um, farm soils there that have been documented as important soils in the state and nationally. Um, there's uh, prime for forest soils for forestry. Um, uh, it has two waterways crossing it, uh, Grand Brook and West Brook. Um, and there's actually an interesting isolated population of native fish. Oh yes, thank you for the map. Um, and this is from the conservation restriction. Um, uh, Grand Brook is a smaller uh, waterway. Um, West Brook runs along the sort of Northeast um, border of the property that is an uneven line, as you can see on the, on the survey or the sketch there. Um, and um, this population of fish has been studied by USGS service and, and others um, and has been isolated for, Bill, is it a thousand years potentially? Is they, some they long, long period close, of time. 900, close enough. They, they, uh, the the uh, brook trout 
I'm also a member of Trout Unlimited, so I have a particular passion for protecting uh, this resource of uh, the fish and all that. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, as Emily said, the U.S. Geological Survey is doing research not only on Ground Brook, which runs through our property, but uh, Westbrook, uh, Jimmy Nolan, and I think Mitchell Fork or something like that. Uh, all of those three tributaries that run into um, Westbrook. And um, uh, this is a long-term study. It's going on for, it's already going on for a number of years and it's going to continue for many years. And with climate change, it's it's sort of critical information that they're determining. It's going to be applicable throughout New England and other places as well. But they did find out uh, several years ago that the, um, uh, the small, the small little stream. It's amazing. There's a fair amount of water that comes through that little stream. That it, uh, um, and it's only about, I don't know, half a mile, three quarters of a mile long, if that. It, uh, it has a unique population of uh, native brook trout. And when I see native, they've always been there. So that goes. Ever since brook trout were around, they, it was never been stocked. And they can't reproduce outside of that little stream because at the end of the stream, there's a, uh, a waterfall and they can't get back up the waterfall. So whatever fish are in that, in that stream are there forever. And uh, I'm not sure how they figured this out, but they, they've determined that the, uh, the fish have been isolated from the rest of the watershed for approximately 900 years. So it's a unique gene pool to say the least. And, I'm very proud of it. And of course, we have a lot of other nice things about our property too. And we're looking forward to uh, having our conservation restriction and, you know, doing the right thing in terms of still using the land, making it useful for forestry and agriculture, but also preserving it for future generations. Um, recreation is another allowed um, activity and, they can improve wildlife habitat, um, remove invasives if they just so desire. These are all things that are allowed with, uh, under the restriction for, for um, uh, no bears and any future owners. Um, on the map, you can see that it's sort of divided into two areas. Parcel B is the larger area. It's a little over 38 acres. And um, this, uh, parcel A is around two acres by the road. Um, parcel A has an orchard area that's right on the roadway. And then you can access um, parcel B through a right of way that goes around the West Wheatley Cemetery, um, which is sort of in, surrounded by the Obear property. So the public access to the cemetery is not obstructed. Um, there's a, a, a pipe line that runs through that um, uh, is maintained and there's rights to maintenance by the city of Northampton. It's a water pipe um, and um, I wonder if I can, is it, would it be possible for me to share a map? Um, I, don't, I don't know whether the permissions allow me to, but I could just show you a map that shows the surrounding conserved area. Um, yeah, one sec, okay. Sure thing, no problem. All right, try that. Thank you. Yep. All right, let's see if that works. So what I'm, I'm trying to show is something labeled Obear property, Waitley Mass, that shows their property in, outlined in red, that's fairly small, right next to the Waitley Mass Department of Fish and Game uh, wildlife management area. Is that what it looks like to all of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So the, the red outlined area is the Obear property. And then the various colored properties are other conserved land nearby. So it's right across the street from a, a fish and game wildlife management area. Um, uh, it's to the south of the, the Mount Esther um, wildlife map, um, another holding fish and game. Um, and then the, the pink or, or lavender parcels are various um, properties holding by municipalities, um, most of which relate to water. Um, you can see the city of Northampton Mountain Street Reservoir to the south as well. So there's a there's a lot of other conserved land in this area. So um, Bill and Jane are joining up a portion of their land 
to contribute to the, the wildlife um, uh, habitat continuing on in the future in this area. Um, and there's also farms in the area. So there's, it's, it's both doing both double duty or triple duty. There's fish uh, habitat on the river. There's forests um, for wildlife and also for timber management. Um, and then there's uh, agricultural area on the property, a field, and then the orchard area. Um, and some, sometimes people have questions about what impact the conservation restriction will have on taxes and the tax roll. The land's enrolled in chapter 61A, which means that the taxes that are assessed on the land are um, determined by a formula relating to that. So there will be no change on this land to my knowledge. And um, if it wasn't enrolled under chapter 61, it's often the case that back land um, that isn't currently developed um, is um, assessed at a lower rate. So there's, it's often fairly neutral. Um, and as since um, a two, about two acres of house lot is being excluded, that will continue to be taxed at a you know, residential rate and um, the um, composting business is at it's, it's a, a separate rate too. So the property overall seems like it's gonna have a really wonderful balance of preserving very unique uh, natural resources for wildlife, um, as well as some um, active management areas for agriculture and forestry, um, and then setting aside, you know, continued use for um, homes and businesses in the in the town. So um, I think that's all. I, those are the main highlights of it. Um, Bill, if you wanted to say a word or two just about your, your hope for it, you, I know you talked about it a little bit before, but if you have anything to add, um, that'd be great. Well, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm well. This is something I've been interested in doing for a long time, and now that the time is to do it, uh, to do it now, um, I uh, we have for some time been involved or are interested in land conservation. In fact, the uh, uh, fish and wildlife land across the street which was purchased, much of which was purchased from the, uh, the Judsons many years ago. We were involved in, uh, in that and actually donated a parcel to Fish and Wildlife to help them or sort of leverage them to consider purchasing the larger parcel. So we, we, we like land conservation, but at the same time, we also like, like we don't wanna see land just locked up and you can't do anything on it. So we do uh, uh, want to see the land as a working landscape. Uh, the, the, the forest land, uh, we, we do manage for, uh, for timber and wildlife. We've had at least two logging uh, operations over the years. And the farmland is currently being hayed. And then there's a portion that's also being, uh, uh, main, uh, being utilized by my partner who's running the compost and the business now. So uh, we think it's a very special piece of land. Of course, everybody thinks that about their land, but it is, it's, it's quite nice. And uh, well, uh, we've got all kinds of wildlife. I mean, wildlife on top of wildlife around here. So uh, we're re really pleased about pursuing this. And, uh, and the Franklin Land Trust has been very helpful in us, uh, uh, helping us along and, getting all the proper questions answered and all that sort of thing. So that's it. We're looking forward to it. And uh, I, I, this will add obviously to Waitley is developing quite a bit of land now in, in uh, uh, protected land, APR land and uh, conservation land like this, fishing game and what have you. So it'll add to that. And I, I think that's a good thing. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, we spoke with the Conservation Commission members last week, um, and I hope that they communicated um, to the select board. They'd said that they would reach out, um, and to us, they expressed support for the for moving ahead. Yeah, I can speak directly to that. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, hi, Scott. Hey, hi. Scott. Yeah, lurking in the background. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the Conservation Commission reviewed this with uh, with Bill and with Emily at our meeting last week. And uh, we'd like to communicate our uh, enthusiastic support for this CR. Thank you. Much Thanks, appreciated. Uh, 
-hmm. and, and I can just, I can confirm the things that they said about the natural resource values of the property. And in particular, the uh, unique population of uh, brook trout, which I'm also aware of from having talked to Ben Letcher and others who've worked on that population. It really is a very interesting and, and unusual population of fish. Uh, so even if it didn't have all those other values, I would say, let's do it for the fish. Well said. <laughs> Are there any questions that you have about the conservation restriction or the land or the process? Hmm. Yeah, I have one or two questions, but maybe um, I'll let Fred go first. Yeah, I just want to uh, clarify that the Franklin Land Trust will be doing the oversight enforcement of this and not the town? That's correct. Great question. What we're asking for right now is your vote for approval, but not for acceptance. And if, if we were asking the town to hold it, we would ask you to accept the, the um, interest as well. But um, this is just a, a part of the, the standard formula as, as determined by the state that you should always bring the, a restriction to the attention of the town. Um, the land trust will be the holder of the restriction and will take on responsibility for annual monitoring and visiting to make sure that the terms are being um, agreed to and then enforcement should that be necessary. And this runs with the land, not with the owner. Correct, exactly, it's in perpetuity. Yeah, that, I guess that was the, the one thing I wanted to double check. I mean, it's in all caps, but in perpetuity basically means uh, as long as the government exists to enforce law and order, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, which is good. So um, I, maybe, maybe I don't know if I have a question so much as a, hey, this is what I think, am I understanding it correctly? That the land is already in, has a conservation restriction under chapter 61A, but that's a conservation restriction that's not really in perpetuity. That's one that uh, if you want to take land out, you can. There's some tax uh, consequences for that, but the owner still has the, that particular option if they want to. But in this case, uh, basically the owner is giving up that right to take it out of conservation at some point. Um, and that, that, that that so in perpetuity really means we're changing sort of the status of this particular conservation restriction to a much more permanent one. Is that my understanding that correctly? Yes. Um, chapter sixty one is is as you described a, a temporary agreement by a landowner. Um, it um, you know there's short term uh, and years ahead. period where it would um, uh, end. Uh, and then landowners can take their land out of it even before that 10 year term is done. Um, yeah. And um, the land conservation, conserva land under a conservation restriction is changed basically so that the land use can't include residential, commercial, or industrial development. But this particular restriction allows um, a wide variety of natural land management so that people can do forestry, can create trails, can do hunting and recreation um, yeah. and, um, for, and agriculture as well. Yeah, so under, um, under recreation, that was gonna be my other question. Um, it seems like, um, like the use of motorized vehicles is, is significantly restricted. And as far as recreation goes, snowmobiles would be allowed. And I think that's historically been the case but um, would ATV, you know, in the non-snow season, would those be allowed? I think not from what I read, but I don't know if I, if I caught everything. You've got a good eye. Oh, um, okay. motorized, right. motorized vehicles for recreational purposes solely are not allowed, but the, um, the allowance that is made for motorized vehicles is if they're being used for, for a particular use that relates to the management or um, some of the other purposes that are allowed, such as agriculture and forestry. Right. And things like it has a little places as camper trailers and recreational vehicles, but you can only have one so-called motor home um, uh, on the premises. And presumably that's probably in the service of the kinds of permitted land use. We're not, you're not trying to like, this is not like Bill's retirement. 
No. He's going to get into an RV uh, out in his, in, in, and fish uh, brook trout for the rest of the No, is... no, those brook trouters are being, they're, they're on their own. Okay. Uh, the, uh, we, <laughs> my wife has a very small camper. And we want to, and she has a little spot picked out in the woods. And it's, I mean, you, you would never even see it unless you were looking for it. Okay. And that's all that's said about. Sometimes uh, in conservation restrictions, people um, ask for the right to create a, a tenting platform or, um, mm-hmm. you know, to have an area that's slightly improved in a way that won't damage the land at all. So yeah. this is a, a, a okay. provision so, that's sort of along those lines. It, it seemed like when it was restricted to one, that yeah. that was the important thing that exactly uh, that like a future owner probably couldn't exploit that very much no um and build a mansion there and call it a mobile home yeah so yeah okay I, I, those I, my... I do have one other question the, oh, the go ahead, property Fred. pretty much surrounds west waitley cemetery mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. would would there ever be a possibility of expand if we want to expand that cemetery would that be a permitted use if we purchased a portion of this, if the town were to acquire a portion of this land? There's two issues there. The land um, can't be subdivided um, from its current boundaries. And then um, cemetery uh, use would not be a permitted use. um, Mm -hmm. So that it it would at this point say that the the boundaries of the cemetery couldn't expand into the conserved area. Okay. Can I can I make a comment on that? Um, so the reason the the reason why this w- was brought to mind, why I remembered it was, we had um, we had discussions with. Uh, I think it was MDAR about the East Waitley Cemetery. And on the East Waitley Cemetery, on two sides, we have APR land. We have the road, and then we have a single family house. Um, and it was going to be literally take an act of legislature, obviously, to, to release a, even like a 10 foot strip of that land to, to um, expand the East Waitley Cemetery. So, so my question was whether, whether we're, we're, we're tying our hands here with the um, with the conservation restriction, keeping in mind also that, you know, uh, the center cemetery in Waitley is also, it's pretty, it's pretty constrained as well. There's wetlands in the back. Um, I'm not saying it as a, as a reason not to do this. I just want to, you know, have that discussion that at some point the town's going to need to expand, um, you know, expand or find new areas for cemeteries as part of our responsibility to provide for burials. So, um, Hmm. I just wanted to 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 have that discussion, and I, I don't know if you if if the cemetery commissioners have been approached at all, or they've been involved in the process before. Um, I don't. I'm not really sure. I think this is the first time that that I've heard about this. So um, that wasn't necessarily on our radar in terms of the the use of the land for in the future. Um, so we haven't been in discussions with the, the cemetery committee. I talked to somebody, I can't, I don't know who, but maybe within the last couple of years, and they asked if we we would be interested in selling land to the cemetery. And I, I said, well, likely not. Okay. And frankly, when you think about it, uh, the goal here is to conserve land and have a working landscape at the same time. Um, but realistically, if, if land was sold to the cemetery and then another 20 years or 30 years and some more land would have to be sold and for more people. And I don't know, I think the best thing would be to find a, find a totally different spot in town. And, uh, you know, it would really uh, impact uh, the, what we're trying to do here with the conservation. And frankly, I like that cemetery. I go over there. I know a number of the people in it now, though, more recent ones, and I, the uh, people that have been there for a long time, including uh, Isaiah Brown, who built our barn that's right next to the road back in the 1770s. It's a very unique and beautiful old cemetery. And um, I'm not against that, but I really think, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of land there left to go. Uh, 
unless we have an uh, atomic bomb here and kills off half the town, I think we're, uh, we're in pretty good shape for a while there. That's my opinion. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention that, yeah. that at some point it's going to be an issue in terms of cemetery space. And not, I don't know that this is the right answer, but um, mm -hmm. it, it, would preclude, uh, it, it would preclude it from, from happening in the future. So it, it's my understanding it, it would. Does the I, um, town have an obligation to provide a uh, cemetery space for uh, yeah. for residents? I mean, what, what is our obligation, I guess, and to what extent are we obligated to make sure that there's a uh, cemetery space for people? Um, in conversations that I had with, with the cemetery commissioners, I, I can't cite the Mass General Law right now, but they, they believe that there is a duty under Mass General Law to provide for burial space of town mm -hmm. residents. I have an aerial that shows the boundaries of the, the cemetery space. Um, may I share that? Yep, yeah, one sec. Thank you. All right, you should be all set. Great. So this is from the baseline document that um, is being prepared as part of you know, our due diligence in showing where land is. Um, are you seeing an aerial with blue and red lines on it? Or, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So the red lines are the, the area that is to be conserved. And the there's, you can see actually the, the town parcel lines are a little bit different from what's surveyed. Um, there, the assessors have been notified and, and um, have been provided with the surveys to update that. Um, the area that's clear here there, where there's a call out box and a red dot is the cleared area of the, the cemetery lot. And then there's a great deal of wooded area around that within the, let's see, so it's a black line and then a blue and red um, boundaries where the, um, uh, the, the, the outline of the cemetery lot. And I've got, um, let's see, I can open up this up here. Um, are you seeing now the cemetery lot or are you still seeing the red? Uh, uh, cemetery okay. lot. Okay. No. So, so this is the outline. This is a I mean, cert. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to comment. You see that rectangle. Oh, go back to the other one. There we go. Okay. That rectangle, that was the original cemetery lot. And all the other land was purchased from uh, Paul, Paul and Artist Judson quite a number of years ago. In, in anticipation of use. So, you know, it's not that no land has been made available to the cemetery, there is quite a bit of land, but it's a little, you know, the land has a little bit of a slope to it in some places, but there, there's room for a lot more uh, dearly departed for sure. Um, Just going back to the area, it looks yeah. like as, as, as Bill was saying, the area that's been cleared of the property is not the majority of it, or it's maybe half of it, so that there's at least, you know, um, a couple more acres, a good portion of uh, the, the expanded area. Ex excuse me, on the overhead, the mm -hmm. legend at the bottom is getting cut off on my screen. What is the oh, blue that's better? Thank okay, you for so I, that out. I'm just curious why the open, that the blue line that you're right at now, is not well. You, you've got the red line for the the blue is different from the, the red. Right. What what is That's the status right. of the, the sure. land in between that? So the blue lines are from the tax parcel layer, okay. and when the land was surveyed, um, you can see that these outlines match the the cemetery survey, and then um, let's see the. Um, uh, the, uh, the surveyed property of the of bears. Okay. This is a picture of that. Um, it, it, the, the tax parcel layers that are used um, uh, to you know, figure out the assessment for taxes weren't brought into alignment with the survey. So this area, the blue area around where this, the cemetery is, yeah. um, is, is inaccurate. It's, it's common okay. that, you know, when a property gets surveyed, then you realize, oh, that was, was a little bit off. 
so that it's um, other protected open space is showing that the land across the street, is, which is the um, wildlife mess, um, management area, um, that those are the outlines there. Okay, that answers it. And the cemetery. I spoke with the, uh, I, I was met with Cynthia Herbert today, and <clears throat> we've been trying to get some things resolved related to the town tax map and our 1987 survey. Apparently, the, the 1987 survey was not properly utilized in preparing our parcel uh, as it as exists now. They're, they're going to amend it according to the survey as of today. I had a meeting with them and I spoke with the fella who is working on the, uh, who does the tax map and is working on changes. And he even brought up the, sur I mean, we had a little problem down in the right-hand corner, which is, quickly resolved by the survey, but he said, well, what's going on with the uh, cemetery? You know, there's a, it says 303 feet here and you're, uh, and, and uh, the, the problem was, is that it's, thanks, Emily. Maybe we'll go back to that other one, if you can. The cemetery? Okay. Yeah, cemetery. You know, we have a, we have a, we have a basically distances and angles for all of this. And in the case of the cemetery uh, and the tax map is that it, it looked like if you look at the angles, in some cases they were not exactly right or off and all the distances were off a little bit. And I think what happened was whoever was doing the tax map way back when this was done, they might've, it wasn't based on a survey they might have uh, scaled it with it, which which a lot of people do. And even the uh, the fellow I was speaking with today, he said he uses a scale all the time where you have a, a special ruler in tents or whatever, and you put it down somewhere and he's okay, this is 322 feet or whatever. But reality is the survey. And he agreed and said, he's going to correct it according to the survey, because those are about as accurate as you can get particularly with the modern techniques that are done now. So as Emily said, that's all going to be brought back in line. So the, the red line will be the line that we're talking about, right, Emily? That's That'll right. Be, I'll go back to that. Line. Now. We're going to go back to that. Right. Okay. All right. But that's sort of not our fight. It's they duke that out with the assessors and they'll. Um, yeah, I was just curious why the lines didn't line up like they probably should have. Yeah, exactly. You're right. You're right. And we aren't duking it out. We're coming to an understanding. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, some, some people call that duking it out. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, so looking, looking there, at the boundaries and the, and the map, I hope that um, given that there is a need for expansion in the future of the cemetery, that the, the couple of acres or the acre and a half that's still undeveloped on the cemetery might be sufficient. So. Okay. Um, does anybody, including the general public here or Amy or Hannah or Brian, does anybody have any further questions they wanna ask of Emily or Bill or? Okay, sounds like um, I'm not hearing anybody jumping up and down wanting to say something. So maybe um, the, the thing we have to vote on is whether to approve this um, and uh, just meaning basically give it our blessing. Uh, we won't be holding the conservation restriction. So this approving it just means we won't block it from moving forward. Is that like a like a reasonable layman's term for what means uh, what approval means here? Um, I believe so. Giving the no, town's guess, approval. I guess I would entertain a motion then to. Uh, I, uh, I would move we approve the conservation restriction. Okay, yes. I'll second that. 
Um, uh, all in favor? Fred? Aye. Me? Aye. Okay. Uh, so it looks like there's something that we'll have to sign. I think it has. Yep. It is notarized. It, it has to be notarized. It does need to be notarized. Mm -hmm. So we have to come in when Lynn is there to sign this? Um, or, you can sign oh, it well, because you're personally known to her, yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. Good. Okay. Uh, great. All right. Let me get back to the point where I have my agenda. Uh, the, I know you, you've never had this happen to you, but I have a, a thousand windows up on my computer. Oh, there's the agenda. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Great. All right. So schedule appointments are done. Um, and now we're on to old business. Thank you. Um, I guess we're all set. Thank, well, thank you, all. you so much. Thank thanks. you very much. And thanks to okay. Scott for speaking and to everyone for your questions and consideration. Take good care. Hey, thanks, Emily. Yep. Thanks, Bye -bye. Scott. Thanks, Larkin. Well, maybe Larkin will stay around. Oh, yeah, there we go. Well. All right. So we've got some old business next. And one uh, first item under old business is to discuss the status of town buildings and other protective COVID-19 measures. And here, I think Brian is the one who can lead us through that. Yep, so we discussed this last week and the board said that it wanted to discuss at every meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So lots of fun. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. Um, so since the last meeting, um, I reached out to the town council to get more information about, about what in their opinion, so it's their opinion what towns and towns can and cannot do, and, and who can do it in terms of uh, uh, vaccination uh, vaccination requirements. Um, so I shared with the board that um, the town council thinks that it's within the within the authority of the board of health um, under Mass General Law Chapter One Eleven in sections thirty one and eighty one um, to impose vaccination requirements. Um, so when we were talking last meeting, what we had from the Board of Health was a recommendation from the Board of Health to the select board that it adopt regulations concerning town buildings, um, a number of regulations concerning town buildings, masks, socially distancing, uh, so people being socially distanced, um, air purification or ventilation. Um, so it was, it's, it's KP Law's opinion that, that that authority to require uh, vaccinations in public buildings would rest with the Board of Health. Um, so I guess it's a decision for the board. It, the, bo the board can continue with its, with its current policy in terms of requiring um, vaccinations for private events, um, but it would be the recommendation of town council that that come from the Board of Health. Mm. It'd be a decision of the Board of Health. In terms of all the other requirements, there, there wasn't much of a concern. Um, so whether the Board of Health wants to or, or doesn't want to do that, um, I communicated with them that I think if they want to do that, um, it needs to be a really um, detailed and buttoned up policy because um, there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of rights that they need to try to balance in terms of vaccination requirements, medical exemptions, religious exemptions, um, and definitions in terms of what's fully vaccinated, what's not fully vaccinated, um, whether there's an exemption for testing, uh, a current test. Um, there, there's, lots of, there's lots of things that need to be um, figured out when, when a policy like that is adopted or a regulation like that is adopted. Um, So I, I encourage them that that if they want to move forward with something like that, that they that they could reach out to town council and have that discussion. Um, so that's what I what I got from council. Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of what the board wants to do with with sort of town buildings, I'll I'll back up for a second for for town buildings in general, um, whether we want to uh, change anything or, or not. Right now, the, the, the last policy that the board or the last thinking of the board was that town buildings would, would still be closed to in-person public meetings and it allowed, um, I guess, what we call 
private meetings or, or meetings not needing to be posted under the open meeting law. Um, so that included private events um, would be allowed with would be allowed with masking, socially distance, you know, good air purification, ventilation, which we have in our buildings. Um, what am I forgetting? Um, and vaccine, and then and then the vaccine requirement, and then the board of health would also want to add that 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 whoever's hosting the event keep a keep an attendance sheet or a login sheet where if contact tracing were required, that it would be easier on them to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty much what I have. Um, mm -hmm. A friend told me that I think the Board of Health meets next Tuesday, and they were going to talk about um, the information from council. Um, I asked him if, if, if they would also talk about um, what their opinion is in terms of reopening count buildings. I, I think this is my opinion. I think, I think the discussion and the thinking for the Board of Health last time was more focused on sort of private events and how, to, how are those done safely. And I, I, I'm, I've asked a more pointed question about, well, we want to open up, or how can we, or can we, if we can, how can we reopen town buildings for, ta you know, for town uses, for town meetings, for, for public meetings, those types of things? Because, I mean, that's what, that's what these buildings are, are here for, really. So, mm -hmm. um, mm. I, yeah. I'm personally am more than happy to defer to the uh, council's opinion that the Board of Health be the determining body on this. And I don't even know if it's, if we need to pass anything that says that. If right. that's what the law is, then we simply abide by what the Board of Health comes down with. I would just urge them to make the regulations as detailed and precise as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even in last time we were meeting, that discussion, we were really relying on what the Board of Health had voted. Um, I mean, I, I certainly um, did uh, rely on kind of what, what they voted and their recommendation really, to me, makes a difference because I'm not a healthcare professional. I don't have any personal reason to, um, to be able to say one way or the other. Um, I, I would just hope that in the future there, determinations are a little more precise than that generalized <laughs> letter of recommendation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess um, I might put that Board of Health meeting on my calendar and kind of go there and watch and see what's happening. Um, but I, I still think the, the difference between a, a public meeting that's governed by open meeting law uh, and, and all of those things is sort of a different thing than a historical society meeting or Grange meeting or uh, a concert or something like that. And I know the, the policy we have right now is um, not exactly what council would want. They'd want the Board of Health to be saying that um, I imagine we can manage for another two weeks under that policy because um, I, I don't really want to shut down, you know, the Grange and the Historical Society. And I don't actually know if there are any concerts scheduled. Um, I don't think I want to shut down uh, those events, but I think we have real issues with open meeting law and, uh, and you know, people being, being able to access their government when it comes to public meetings. And I think I'd like the clarity of the Board of Health weighing in on that. And if they decline to take any action, then that's a that's sort of a different story. Then we have to decide whether we wanna open things or not. And- um, Well, and, the question then is, you know, we'd no. have to go back to council. Do we even have the authority to pass I, oh, no, I mean, if they decline. We can, we can decide if the buildings are open or not. Right. But I don't think we get to say there's a mask mandate or there's a, uh, uh, you know, the we can do things mandate. like strongly recommend and things like that, but we can't require. So if, you know, the, if the Board of Health won't decide, then our decision is, are sort of more 
I don't know, um, more crude, if that's the right word. I mean, we can decide, <laughs> are you going to have in-person meetings or not? The Board of Health gets to decide um, what constitutes a fully vaccinated person or uh, if you're not fully vaccinated, testing and what do you have to, and it, it, that's what they, that's their job. Um, so I sort of feel like I don't, uh, I, I, I don't want to go on just an email from Fran because even in, uh, you know, in his email communications, he's been very clear that this is his opinion, but the Board of Health is meeting next Tuesday. We'll, uh, we'll be able to discuss it then. So I, I'd like to maybe defer to our next meeting and then put that Board of Health meeting on my calendar um, so that at least to the best of our ability, we can get uh, as good a guidance as we can from our Board of Health who are awesome, hardworking people, more than half our healthcare professionals. And, um, and I, I think I wanna support them and what they decide uh, as best I can. I think ultimately the decision, the larger decisions are theirs and that we yeah. essentially ways, yeah. make decisions only if they decide not to on some yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. So if they so they can give us, you know, conditions under which they think it's safe to open um, the buildings to, you know, regular commerce, so to speak, or the commerce of government, right? Um, mm -hmm. Then then I think I would take that very, very seriously. Especially if, if it's in conjunction with a st set of regulations or stipulations, mm. mandates, non-mandates, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, re I'm really glad for the very timely input from council on this. Yeah. Um, that, that, that was extremely helpful to kind of clarify who's, whose role is what. I mean, who's got what role? in in this i mean we have we have authority over opening town buildings or not but it's really the board of health that has authority over uh, the things like mandating a vaccine or mandating a mask or things like that well, essentially the terms under which the buildings will be open yeah no. yeah and so the board of health meeting is at 5 30 on uh november 2nd Okay, it's, it's virtual and the login is is on their agenda that's posted on the town website and I, the, you know, one of the other things from 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 town council's opinion was that so there was there's a different set of rules when there was a state of emergency, and when there's not yeah. a state of emergency and there's different powers that each has when those are in play right the select board in a state of emergency probably has more latitude to enact regulations in 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 conjunction with the Board of Health, or as in times where the state of emergency isn't in effect, you know, we're back to the the rules that in Mass General Law in terms of the Board of Health passing reasonable health regulations. So, um, I don't know. We're all learning. <laughs> no, I'm with you there. Yeah. 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 Okay. For, for so, we're, we're we're learning for the next pandemic. Yes. Right. Let's hope not. <laughs> All right. Um, besides that one uh, item about whether town buildings are open or not, it sounds like we're, I feel like the consensus is that we want to wait till we hear more from the Board of Health and not change yep. what we have right now. Is there anything else um, under that uh, old business item A that you think we need to discuss, Brian? Um, I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, good. Well, then um, it sounds like uh, we, we sort of agree not to take much, not to take any action now, but to um, keep this on the agenda for next time and listen closely to what the Board of Health has to say next Tuesday. Um, so um, why don't we go on to a, a mold business um, item B? Yep. Which is to discuss letters of interest received in response to the center school request for interest, ideas, and innovation, and to discuss next steps for the project. So that is, yeah, I turn that over to Brian as well to, uh, to kind of summarize that part. Yep. So you'll recall we put out our request for, um, I always forget what we called it, for the RFI. Um, 
interest, ideas, and innovation. So it should be R-F-I-I-I, but... Um, and as part of that, we had a site visit where um, any interested parties could come and, and take a walk through the building and, and walk the property. And we asked for um, letters of interest to be submitted by October 25th. Um, so during the site visit, we had probably eight to 10 um, people that came to walk through the building, um, walked on the property, had some questions. Then I also met with, with uh, two other folks at a different time um, to walk through the building. Um, so it was, it was nice to see that level of interest. Um, people seemed pretty excited. I think the overall consensus was that the building itself, although it may not look it, but is, is in pretty good shape in terms of the bones of the building are still pretty good. Um, a lot of the mechanical systems are, are, are older. Um, so, and, and plumbing and those types of things, plumbing and, and, and heating, uh, would need some, would need some work. Um, also the, it seems like the roof would need some work. It's an, it's an older slate roof. So, um, but there seemed to be a lot of interest and, uh, people left, I think in, still interested in, in the, in the, in the building, um, whatever the town decides to do with it. Um, so we received two letters of interest. Again, the RFI is not a binding process. It's a way for the select board to gather more information about what people might be interested in doing with the building. And then what, what the board receives uh, could help inform the terms of an RFP if that's so the request for proposals. That would be where the town solicits proposals that, can, that are binding on the uh, proposer if the town accepts them. Um, so the R5 process can help the town, um, help the select board see what people might be interested in doing. So it's part of the RFP if there's a shared mutual interest. Um, so there, are, you, we received two letters um, and I included them in the meeting packet that, um, that was sent to the board. Um, so the first one talked about uh, the idea of having a, um, an affordable uh, daycare operated out of the lower level of the building with office space in the on the first floor middle middle floor I guess we'll call it the upper floor not being the attic and then the attic um, being um, living space essentially um, and then the second proposal um, suggested the building uh, be used more for its traditional use as a, as a school um, as an alternative learning center um, Looking to it, um, mm -hmm. so it's an alternative learning center um, for kids aged uh, five to twelve who opt out of traditional schooling. So I think that would be like a resource and a, a alternative learning center where those kids could go for mm -hmm. um, non traditional schooling. So uh, those are the two um, letters, and there's, there's obviously more details that that are in the letter. Yeah. Um, that that the that the board can read. Um, so that I guess that's where we are with with the process. Mm -hmm. um, we can, I guess, we could do whatever we want to do and whatever the board wants to do. And it's I don't know if we want to decide that tonight or not. But um, it's it's really next steps, mm -hmm. right? It's do we mm -hmm. want to, does the does the board want to put out an RFP? And if the board does want to put on an RFP, then we need to draft that and decide the terms of what the RFP would be. Um, in terms of ownership, um, preferred uses, prohibited uses. So it's, it's really not something that we were prepared to get into tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, or um, <laughs> we could do nothing because that's always an option, right? Um, I don't know if that's the preferred option. Um, so you, I don't know. You indicated in you indicated the fact that there were possible other interest. Yep. With that, did not specifically respond to this request. Any ideas what types of usage those other people might be looking at? 
no. Um, I mean, the one person who I who I spoke with who who wasn't there thought it would be a great single family house. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, no, nobody really uh, presented any any other concepts. Um, yeah, because in shaping an RFP, that would be useful to know what other people right. might have in mind. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not sure to to what extent. You know, it's always whether folks are comfortable sharing their idea, in mm. in a in a process that yep. that makes them show their hands before it's binding, right? Um, so I, I think there might have been some of that going on as well, um, mm. but it, it's it's obviously I don't know. It's hard to tell. Mm. Well, I think both of these. Um... RFIs are pretty interesting. I mean, I, I'm, in some ways, I'm really intrigued by the idea that the people who were responding the most are not. I mean, one of the proposals is more um, entrepreneurial than the other, right? In the sense that they're thinking of, well, let's have this office space and that might actually help offset the cost of the, the daycare center and the daycare center being in the basement. And I'd like that that would um, uh, make good use of the land there that, uh, you know, having children play on that wonderful hill. I really, uh, I really kind of like that idea. Um, and that, that having childcare there, it really is. I mean, if there was childcare at the center school when I had children, that's where my children would have gone. Absolutely, there. Um, I mean, it meets a community need, and and I really like that. Um, but I also like the the other one, which is still education related, and and um, in this uh, sort of alternatives to kind of traditional uh, public education. Um, and uh, they at, at the end where they talk about. Um, uh, Nicholas Jones as a general contractor, that kind of, that makes a difference to me because I, I know Nicholas and I, he, you know, it, he, he knows what he's doing. And um, uh, the people at North Star uh, Self-Directed Learning, they, it's not like they've just been around for six months. They've been around for a while and they've been um, doing a good service for students who don't necessarily fit into the the more mainstream public education. So I'm really intrigued by both of these. And um, uh, if I, my understanding is that an RFP would be a little bit more specific than an RFI. So for example, in, in one of these, they say that they would be looking to uh, renovations done by the town um, or a rental agreement in exchange for making the updates and repairs. I guess there is something where I think the details would be really important to know. And you would get those details in our in RFP if I understand it right. Or we should uh, get those details yeah. in an RFP. You know. So I, I guess I, I'm pleasantly surprised by what we got. As, yeah, as am I. I. I like both of the avenues that these present uh, as at least as possibilities. Yeah. And if it were to turn into a single family residence, that's, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't feel bad about that either. Um, the, the one that has office space and residence, that's an interesting one as well. Um, that one seems to have less uh, of a reliance on maybe the town doing any repairs or things like that. Um, but it seems like people understand the pros and cons of that building. And, um, and so I kind of think that's, um, that's good. I'm glad that at least two groups took us seriously enough to write a, uh, an RFI. So then I, I, I guess uh, if we want to move forward with, with, with pursuing future uses of the building, then it's likely that an RFP is probably the way to go at this point. Mm. 
I, I think that would be a, a I, next step. And I think with that, we, with, with it, some interest shown, I think, I, I mean, I know things take time, but we should proceed to the next step on an RFP, I think. Um, I mean, I don't, I think that doesn't mean an RFP is out there tomorrow, but um, uh, I think- no, I, I agree. I think we should put together an RFP, which will take, certainly take some massaging and tweaking to, to mm -hmm. word the way we want to anyway. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm gathering that that's something that, that yeah. we should take a crack at here. Yeah. yeah. Do we need an official vote on that? Um I don't I don't think so. We'll need one to 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 put it out when we're when we're done with it. Okay. All right. But I think I have my marching orders. Okay. Oh, yeah, I can I can sort of see your marching, your head's kind of going up and down. <laughs> The only question I have in at least the initial draft of the RFP, do we want to sort of direct it towards an educational use that both of these proposals are have some connection to or make it more general? Mm. I don't know if it serves us well to make it more restrictive, but I think it's it does definitely says something that um, that both of the proposals are, I have at least portions of the the building still in educational use. Um, I guess I would leave that to the people who are writing the RFP. I don't oppose making it more general. I don't think we need to make it more restrictive. I think my my question is: Do we want to give any direction? You know? provide any mm. direction for whoever's mm. writing the RFP, Brian. Yeah, either Brian or Hannah or Amy, right? Or <laughs> oh, okay, Brian or Hannah then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't feel like I need to get further direction on that. Um, okay. Given that, that the other set of input they have are the two RFIs, so. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else we want to talk about on this before we go to new business? I see Brian saying no, Fred saying no. Okay. All right. Um, so under new business, uh, first uh, item is to discuss and vote on entering into an intermunicipal agreement for the veteran services with the Upper Pioneer Valley Veteran Services District. Um, my understanding is they've been doing a reasonably good job. Is there um, anything, any other information that maybe I don't have? Um, no, it's, it's a three-year agreement. Um, there are 28 towns. I, I mm -hmm. lost my number here. Um, but it, it's, it's through the city of Greenfield. Each municipality has a, has a, has an obligation to provide veteran services to its veterans that reside within the town. And this is a, a great example of, of how regionalization can work. So mm. it's a three year, three year intermunicipal agreement. Okay. I have no further comment on it. Okay. Um, well, then I would entertain a motion and maybe I'll make the motion then since, since I haven't made a motion yet today. Um, I'd like to uh, move that we vote to enter into an intermunicipal agreement with the veteran services. Uh, with the upper pioneer, bleh, sorry, upper pioneer valley veterans services district i will second that okay any further discussion okay then i think we can go to a vote um all those in favor fred aye me aye okay great um on to new business part b uh, to discuss the submission of a grant application for the MIIA Fiscal Year 22 Risk Management Program. Um, and that one, I think I'll let Brian do the, the synopsis of that one. Yes, so each year we can apply for up to $10,000 um, for risk management activities. And this is, this is uh, a grant provided through our insurance company. Um, 
in the past, we've gotten um, um, hydrant exercisers that help you open a hydrant. We've gotten well, flammable, uh, not flammable cabinets, cabinets to store flammables in and hazardous materials in. Um, we've gotten a whole bunch of sort of a uh, whole bunch of equipment. Um, we, we haven't heard back from, from our department heads, um, even though I think we asked them to. Um, we heard back from the, mm -hmm. the folks running the transfer station and they have some, a request for um, a whopping $630 in, um, it's really uh, PPE, personal protective equipment that I think should be included in the grant. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking at this point, the grant is due on the, on the 5th. Um, mm. if you would, if you would authorize me to submit a grant for up to the 10,000, um, then I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put what I get in the grant. Uh, obviously there's eligible equipment that, mm. that we have to meet. And if there's, if there's a, if we're over the amount or there's a big, uh, conflict between the department heads about what we're going to apply for, then maybe I'll, I could ask the, the board to, uh, mm. make a ruling, but, um, yeah, I don't, okay. I, I think. I think Keith will probably find some stuff that that they could use at the highway garage, but I'm not sure that I expect much else. Okay. Oh, when well, we got the trench safety, trench safety box one year, mm. trench box one year. Okay. I, I think um, that we give the transfer station people whatever they ask for within reason mm -hmm. that a, they responded and B they've been doing a fabulous job under Difficult circumstances for the last almost two yeah. years. Maybe we should. Yeah, and just a round of applause for the transfer station. Yes. People running it, the uh, Franklin County Waste District, the, everybody involved. Just a uh, big round of applause for all of them. Um, no, I think I completely agree with what Fred said. Put the, put the transfer station on top, and then if other departments respond in time, Try to fill in the rest of the. You said about ten thousand is what we're allowed to ask for. I think ten is the max. Yeah. Okay. Then I fill in the rest of the ten with whatever um, other departments um, might come in with. Uh, do we need an actual vote on that? Um, I, if you could vote to authorize me to submit the grant, I think that that would be sufficient. Okay, I, Fred, I, you I ready will to make a motion? That authorization. To probably okay. be authorized to submit the grant application. Okay, I second that. Uh, all those in favor, Fred. Aye. Me. Aye. Okay, great. Um, we're we are two items short of town administrator updates, so this is a this is a good meeting. Um, uh, item C to welcome Hannah Davis, Community Development Administrator slash assistant town administrator to discuss <clears throat> work priorities and goals for the new position. Um, so for the welcome, I'm sorry it's on Zoom. Let me see what I can do for reactions here um, to, um, let's see, there's one. That's a good reaction right there. Um, I got a thumbs up. I got a clap. Um, oh, there's other choices here. Oh, it's like a really big smiley face. Um, <laughs> We are really happy to have you here. What is that one? I can't tell what that face looks like. Well, I got tears of joy. Uh, tears of joy. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, is this tears of joy? That's tears of joy. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> tears of joy. We are, um, I mean, I, I, we, if we were in person, there'd be like a cake with like candles that when you try to blow them out, they don't actually blow out and they come <clears> back <throat> up. So you have to blow it again. Um, so. So welcome, welcome, Hannah. Um, Thank you. We're really, really you happy so to have you. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm really stoked to be joining Waitley in this position. I think it's going to be a really awesome experience, and I'm so excited to support everyone here. Oh, great, great. We're so really happy to have you. Um, I, may, I, I, I like did my burst of enthusiasm. I should let Fred do the same. And maybe <laughs> Amy and Brian as well. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> okay. No, we're we're thrilled to have you here, and just hope you withstand whatever the onslaught of people asking for pieces of your time is. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, oh we're going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> no, famous last word. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. um, but I guess the, the kind of the greater part of it besides, uh, besides welcome you is discuss work priorities and goals for this new position. And I, I would say everything is really, really important. So everything that's on your description is really, really important. <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, I, I suspect if, if John were here that um, he might say something like um, the uh, applying for grants is really, really important or making sure that we're in a good position to be able to apply for grants is really, really important for this position. Um, but I, I also sort of feel like just the like the expertise that um, volunteer committees don't have that they need is, I mean, to me, those are the two big things. And so I agree with John on the, on the, the and, and maybe I misrepresent, I shouldn't try to represent him, but I know in the past he's, he's very much emphasized the, um, the, the, the getting grants. Um, but boy, providing some, some expertise and some ability to go look into things with the, you know, with, the, with your knowledge of, of um, Massachusetts law and regulations um, so that we don't spend a lot of time, our volunteer boards, pursuing things that are just never going to work out, you know, and I'm thinking particularly of the, the planning board because they're facing some, some difficult questions. Um, uh, which other board? That's the one that comes to mind first, but I'm sure there are other boards that really need uh, support in that way. So to me, those are two really important things. What have I forgotten, Fred? No, th those are the two major elements and both are essentially full-time jobs. So <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we we'll squeeze two full-time jobs into one position. Yeah. And you know, especially the, the grant uh, application job is a very open-ended thing of just going out and, you know, first mining for grant possibilities that are out there and then writing the applications. So as I said, two full-time jobs, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and Ken and I have talked about that. I mean, two things that we have or, or one thing that's starting up is, is we just received the, the grant for the housing to complete the housing production plan mm. and have that certified by uh, DHCD. So we'll be, that grant will allow us to hire a consultant that, that will, that can work with Hannah and um, we'll have to see what's left of the housing committee. Um, it, you know, in, in part of, part of applying for grants is the, is the part that I think takes a lot of time is the, the project development part of it, right? That's, yeah. that's working with the housing committee and maybe another committee we talked about is the energy committee because we have the green mm. communities grant that comes up. We have these grant programs that come up year after year, right? It's going to be the MVP grant that comes up every year, the green communities grant that comes up every year. Now we're going to have these one stop for growth, you know, that, that grant series that's going to, mm. that's going to come up every year. So it, it takes time to work with the housing committee, the energy committee to develop these projects and, Sometimes it might even take a little bit of money to get the data that you need to apply for the grant. Um, but you have to do that legwork mm -hmm. like we did with the open space and recreation plan, with the MVP plan, all of those things. There's a process that we need to go through to, to become eligible for these, you know, for these grants. So um, yeah. I think with Hannah on board, we'll, we'll, we'll position the town really well to, to keep getting those grants year after year. And so, if I can put in a plug, having been on the housing committee, if there's anyone who's watching this <laughs> who wants to help spend that money, um, the housing committee can certainly use. Some I think Chris people, will put that know. in whatever article he writes about this. He's going to put that special plug in for us. Right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. That's going to be the headline. <laughs> <laughs> Waitley seeks yeah. housing committee members. Uh, I, right. I think you know Waitley getting Hannah to to uh, help us out is the headline, really, and um, and and I mean I think it it helps. It, I mean I think it really helps people want to volunteer for yep. town boards if they know they've got kind of the the backup. If some you know, if they don't if they really have to do all of that research on their own, um, it, it would take them ten times longer than it would take you for one thing, and. Um, 
uh, and, and people don't always have the time to do that or don't, I think, don't usually have the time to do that. So it's, yeah. I think it's really, um, this is a really important step for us and, I'm, and we're so glad you're here. Um, I, you know, I can't find another emoji that I haven't already used, but um, I'm going to do a round of applause there. And, and a thank you to the people of the town for approving the position of town meeting this year. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Town of Waitley. Yeah, yeah seconded. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I do know that uh, towns around us that will remain nameless are jealous, so. <laughs> oh, Okay. All right. Well, I think we can we can live with the jealousy, but um, we'll try to do it in a very dignified way, right? Right. Uh, of course. <coughs> Ooh, okay. No, I, right. I, I I really do want to thank the town because it takes some foresight mm. and consideration to to approve a position like this, which isn't necessarily obvious on its face mm -hmm. as a necessity. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I completely, I completely agree with that. That um, um, I think one of the things I found is true about um, voters in Waitley is that when you actually, when you lay out an argument and put down facts, people actually listen, you know, and uh, people generally make I think um, the uh, a good decision when they've got. Um, you know, reasonable information. So that's uh, that's my other compliment to Waitley voters. Oh, and if, if I can also add the finance committee who did not should have any objections to this when it came up, but I assume in some places the finance committee might have had objections. Mm, yeah, yes, indeed. Okay. All right. Um, well, do you need any more direction from us, Hannah? Anything you would like to ask of us at this point? At this moment, no. Um, I have a few deadlines coming up for the Green Communities and for the Culvert Replacement Municipal Assistance Grant. So mm -hmm. um, I'm focusing my attention on those first, just while we have the pressing deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, afterwards, I think I probably will reach out um, to Brian and to the select board just to, as I'm learning more about the position and more about Waitley. Um, to kind okay. of gauge future needs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. And don't hesitate to, I mean, you, you see what a reception you got at this meeting. So please uh, feel free to come at any time um, that you uh, either want or need our input. We're happy to. Yeah. Or just when I need that. some applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Whenever you need some applause. Thank you. All right. Great. Great. Okay. All right. Oh, the last item before town administrator updates um, is uh, discuss possible conflict issues with volunteers serving on multiple boards and committees. So that's one where um, I don't know that I have uh, information. I'm looking at the. No, I think um, it's, it's really just yeah. it's a policy. You know, it's only for a bylaw that. Uh, recognizing that we've got a limited population and a limited number of potential volunteers, it's still uh, difficult. I, I look at it as a potential problem when you've got people who are in multiple positions to uh, what, what really triggered this for me was when I saw one of Chris's articles, it was about the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals approving the Sugarloaf Shops application. But the last paragraph was that one of the Board of Appeals members was a former select board person who had also voted on that same application in that capacity previously. And when you've got mm. three person boards and one of the people and this is not a personal thing. This is a mm -hmm. general policy thing that there shouldn't be one person who's voting on an application or a proposal in multiple capacities. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you know, if you have seven 13 person boards, it's less of an issue. But when you have a three person board, 
and the same person is voting to approve or disapprove an application in multiple venues, that's mm. not good government. Yeah. So Although, it, strictly speaking, the, for, for the cannabis stuff, the select board only approves of the uh, host community agreement. Okay. That's all, I mean, and that's a, a very limited kind of consideration. Um, the ZBA and the planning board have sort of different roles. They have to enforce different um, laws and bylaws. They have to, you know, make sure that they have uh, yeah, that, that uh, everything else is. Yeah. I'm I'm going to say it badly, but that, that everything else is compliant with our laws, and that uh, any kind of uh, concessions we can have on, I don't know shrubbery but it, it's just a question of having they, yeah having one individual who's voting on matters in multiple capacities um yeah. is it, it i'd like problem. to think that we can find people to fill positions without duplicating now you know zoning mm -hmm. board of appeals is quasi judicial select board is policy making planning board can be policy making and to have one person sitting on many of these places right. or sitting on a committee or board that then makes a presentation to the select board such mm -hmm. that a person is presenting to him or herself mm -hmm. uh, is just yeah. not good policy. Yeah. No, I think, um, I, I think that's a good point. Um, Right now, though, the person who's on CBA is a former selectman. That's true. So they're but, not, yeah, but, but because of the timing. But at, at, at that point, at the point where he was an alternate, he was on the select board. Oh, okay. He was already yeah. on the select board. He was on the select board and he was already an alternate on the CBA. Yeah. And I, I don't have a specific proposal here. It's just, Mm. I think something that we should look at to, you know, going down, going forward yeah. as a possible bylaw change to, you know, in, yeah. mo in most places you can't hold two, you know, two elected positions at the same time. Some places you can, in most places you can't. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, and I hadn't thought about that. I, I, I just don't think it's good policy to, yeah. to have one person holding multiple elected positions at the same time or or appointed uh, positions quasi-judicial positions yeah mm. it sounds like it should this is a this is a, a question to our neighboring communities as in hey what are you guys doing for this and then maybe a report right. back to the board that, 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 that's a that's a place to start as i said i don't have mm. a specific language proposal for bylaws yeah but i whether you want to call a conflict of interest or a conflict of loyalties or self-dealing it, 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 yeah. it introduces problems that we don't need to have yeah yeah i think on the on the, sort of the the state ethics standard if that's the right word yeah. is that you have to disclose if there's some kind of conflict of interest and and uh, in kind of in recognition of small towns having sort of a smaller group of volunteers to call on, um, that the disclosure is the important thing, and that uh, the person who's disclosing says that they will, you know, do their best to to not let themselves be biased, but they don't necessarily have to abstain. Um, but and, to me, it, it isn't yeah, even a question of of bias. It's a question of too much input into certain that potentially one person having too much say over projects yeah. that might come before multiple boards. Yeah. And I, that doesn't necessarily, it, you know, I would call it a conflict of loyalty rather than a conflict of interest. Mm. So it may not be we're not talking about something where, where there's a personal business conflict or something. We're just talking about one person hearing arguments about a given proposal in multiple places 
I'm, yeah. you know, being one vote of three person boards in multiple places. Mm. Yeah. So let, let's see what the other, yeah. you know, our okay. other, what other communities in Massachusetts do about this and we can go from there. Okay. All right, that sounds good. We don't need to make a vote on that, right? Mm. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, we are at the, um, the really the highlight of the evening, uh, town administrator updates. The, the highlight was introducing saying hello to Hannah. Now we'll go on to Oh, Brian. sorry. Right. Sort of the <laughs> denouement of uh, town administrator updates. Um, they'll be, this will be fairly short. Uh, reminder that we have a special town meeting scheduled for November 6th. That's a Saturday at one o'clock. Um, it will be at Fort Sandy Lane. Hopefully it will be outside on the patio over here, um, weather permitting. And if not, um, I think um, we'll be inside masked and socially distant. Um, Haydenville Road Project. Um, I said this last time that 25% design is completed and the public hearing will be scheduled shortly. Well, I mean like shortly, shortly, shortly. So it hasn't been scheduled yet, um, but hopefully that will be soon. That's something that's scheduled between the engineer and, and MassDOT. So not something we have control over other than we can keep reminding them that we'd like it to happen yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, Christian Lane Culvert Project, you recall we have the grant from um, the Division of Ecological Restoration uh, for the culvert uh, between Castaways and essentially the Red House and the, the fire station there um, on Christian Lane. Um, Keith and I and Hannah will be meeting with a uh, poss uh, possible engineer that will, that will do some of that work. Um, and we're asking them for a proposal to bring to the board. Um, South County Senior Center Director Search Update. Uh, so a uh, search committee was put together with three town administrators and three uh, representatives from the three councils on aging. Um, and we've received applications, the jobs been advertised, and we're hoping to do interviews um, next week, next week and possibly, uh, a, a day on the week after. Um, so after that, um, the search committee will be making a recommendation, uh, a recommendation to the South County State Center Board of Oversight and the, the Deerfield Select Board as to finalists to, uh, consider from, mm -hmm. um, excuse me. And we had our, uh, free cash has been certified for fiscal year 21 at $619,975. And Enterprise Fund retained earnings is certified at uh, $41,610. Um, <clears throat> the amount for FY21 for free cash is, is pretty in line with what we've had um, over the past, I don't know, what, five, 10 years. Um, so it, it, it's probably in the ballpark of, of what we had anticipated. So that's all that I have right now. Um, I did want to talk about the the second meeting in November and how how the board wants to handle that. If if we kept our regular schedule, that would be the night before Thanksgiving, um, the twenty fourth. So, mm. um, I don't know if we okay. wanted to change that to the. I think in the past here. we've done the, we've moved it to the first week of December. Um, mm. We could also hold on the 24th. Yeah. It's up to. So, up to I mean, November is a month with only one select board meeting, but we would actually have a special town meeting as well. Um, is there any reason to move it from the 10th over to the 17th? That would, um, we could, yeah. Um, or I, we, I suppose it doesn't matter much. In one case, there's two weeks between and then three weeks between. And yeah, either way, there'll be a three weeks between. Yeah. Yeah, it might be. I mean, I'm thinking about what I have on my whiteboard right now. And I mean, we haven't advertised anything for the 10th. So um, it, the 17th yeah. could work as well. Yeah. Unless there's a compelling reason like, oh, there's some things that we need to get done, but we can't get it done by the 10th, but we could by the 17th. Yeah, if there's a compelling reason to move it to the 17th, I'm I'm all ears. But um, if we do the 10th and then December 1st, 
I think that, that sounds fine to me. That sounds yeah. fine. Unless there's some reason to have a special meeting, you know, and we had a special meeting last week. So it can be called a yeah, short we can, notice we if, if we were to need course. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm never bashful about asking for your time if we need to. <laughs> okay. So you might curse at you might curse at me, but at least you don't do it right to my face. So that's appreciated. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll do it behind <laughs> your back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So the tenth, and then tenth the, and the first, uh, December first. Okay. I'm putting that in the calendar right now, so I don't mess that up. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, is there any unanticipated items? Items not anticipated, excuse me. I have nothing. Brian, Hannah? I'm all set. Okay, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Me? Aye. Okay, well, good night, everybody. 